Good morning, good morning. Welcome to the July installment of Leading Well. We're glad that you're here with us this morning, or it may be evening, depending on where you're joining from, or early morning for some of you. Uh, as people come into the room here, we're gonna uh, we'll get started here in just a moment. I uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for taking your valuable time, time out of your busy day, uh, doing lots of other things and all the other demands that you have on your time. We're glad that you are here with us today. And it's, a, it's an honor and it's an honor to have two fantastic guests uh, with us. And I'm gonna introduce them here in just a moment. Uh, for those of you who are familiar and have been following the Center for Leadership for quite some time, who have attended our events and programs, we wanted to make you aware uh, of some exciting uh, updates that we are uh, launching now and I just want to announce some of those. So uh, the first one is we, uh, we are going to be running a fully virtual online program called the Leadership Essentials Program and that is for individual contributors, people who aren't necessarily or maybe have, have had brief moments when they've been in leadership roles, former leadership roles, looking to accelerate their leadership. And that's a, a typically a one day program when we do it in person. Uh, we're moving online, we're doing two half days and that's gonna be September 10th and 11th. It's a great opportunity. We've had fantastic response from that program in the past. And we're also announcing another program from September 28th to October 2nd. It's the Leadership Accelerator Program. That program is designed for frontline managers, people who are managing individual contributors. And uh, we ran that program in the spring, just before COVID uh, took over our world and uh, had a really fantastic, have a fantastic run. And we're excited to be offering this digitally uh, in the fall. We ran our first digital program for one of our custom, uh, for one of the clients that we work with, we've been working with for now 11 years, Miami-Dade County Public Schools. And we, I, I'm really excited and I think we were really excited with how well it went and the great opportunity it was. So we're also going to be running our women's leadership program, which is one of our flagship programs that's going to be coming up too. So just a heads up for those of you who want to want to be involved with some of our more intensive development programs, there are opportunities. And so please spread the word as we, as we get that out. So welcome, welcome. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you and to welcome to Leading Well, uh, Roberto Munoz and Austin Hollow. Uh, Roberto is a man of many talents and we, we will be hearing a little bit about some of those. He is currently uh, the chairman of the board at the World Trade Center Miami. He's the secretary and executive board member of the Beacon Council. And he is the first vice chair, which will lead to chairship of the Great, Greater Miami Chamber of Commerce he has over 40 years in the banking of experience as a, in, in the banking industry and has facilitated, I think, over close to $30 billion in loans. Uh, and again, most recently, it was with First Horizon Bank as the chairman of the Miami market. Uh, and uh, we'll be hearing a little bit about more about his background and some of the work that he does. Uh, and Austin Hollow is also joining us. Austin Hollow is vice president for Florida East Coast Realty. For those of you who are in the Miami area, if you look across the skyline and see the tallest building, and in fact, this is the tallest building north, as Roberto uh, pointed out last week, north of Buenos Aires and south of New York in the Americas. The tallest building is in Miami and it was built by none other than Austin and, and the, the partners in his, in his family firm. Uh, and it is a uh, rental. It's a it's a rental tower that is really broken ground and doing a whole bunch of new things. So uh, Florida East Coast Realty has been, uh, you know, built many things in the South Florida community. And uh, uh, the real reason, also why we have these two gentlemen here with us, is that they are beacons for good in the city of Miami, and they are significantly involved not only in their leadership roles and their work, but they do a lot to make the community that they live in better through their leadership, through their participation in various boards and really getting involved. And so uh, they, and that includes the Center for Leadership at FIU, both are on the Board of Advisors at FIU. So Austin and Roberto, welcome. Good morning. Good morning. 
So let's, uh, let's jump in to just, if you can tell us maybe a little bit about yourself, we'll follow up on some of these, but just for people to get a sense of, uh, of who you are, how you ended up here uh, today or doing what you're doing, and, and we'll take it from there. So uh, I will go first to Austin, and we're gonna, we'll talk about Roberto as the best cheerleader ever. Uh, in a in a minute as as a builder of people, so I know he is looking at me through the lens, saying, "I want you to go to Austin first. So Austin, tell us a little bit about yourself. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Nathan, thank you so much, Roberto. Really, really happy to be doing this with you. Um, a little bit of background on me. Um, graduated from Washington University in St. Louis in, in 2007. There, I studied uh, finance, marketing, organizational psychology. Um, and before joining FECR, where I am now, working with my family, uh, spent a couple years at uh, LNR Partners in Miami Beach doing uh, commercial mortgage-backed security, CMBS, in their real estate finance and, and servicing group. Uh, started at FECR in, in 2009, becoming the third generation of my family to, to join the company. Uh, currently, I'm a senior vice president with the company. Um, and then the, actually the company was started by my, my grandfather, T. Hollow over 60 years ago. And since then, we've built over um, 60 million square feet of construction. So we're really, really proud of that. Um, personally, six, six zero, right? Not six one zero. Six, 60, 60 million years, 60 million square, square feet. Wow. Yes, that's our that's our famous tagline. Yeah. And we're we're still going strong. Um, so for for me personally, um, I focus a lot on the day to day operations of the company, administration as well, um, marketing, leasing, property management, uh, risk management, insurance. Uh, very involved in the financing side, um, underwriting and evaluating any real estate acquisitions um, or, or investments. And of course, you know, working on the development of upcoming projects as well. Um, and then I do work very closely with my, my grandfather, my father, my uncle on the uh, strategic vision of the company and our, and our plans for the future. And actually, um, it's pretty amazing to think I've, I've been there uh, over 10 years now, just celebrated that anniversary, which is pretty exciting. Um, and it's And it's been a lot of fun, like you talked about before, Nathan, you know, our our most ambitious project to date is Panorama Tower. That's where, you know, the vast majority of our focus is right now. You know, we have other developments, a large portfolio um, in downtown Miami, Brickell, uh, Port Gables as well. But, um, you know, Panorama Tower is, is definitely the flagship of our portfolio now at uh, 85 stories, 868 feet high and uh, 821 apartments. So it's a, it's a big undertaking, but it's, it's exciting and it's a lot of fun. And I believe, just as a as a note here, if I correct me if I'm wrong, you had to get FAA, you had to get the FAA to change the rules about clearance for the height of buildings in downtown Miami. Is that correct? So, so the way that that works, and I'm I'm not an expert in that that side of it specifically, but um, you know, height restrictions are are more due to FAA issues as opposed to you know city issues. So Panorama, we, we got that approval for 868 feet and we actually do, uh, believe it or not, have approvals for two more towers in downtown and Brickell uh, that are now approved by the FEA for 1,049 feet. Um, and because you know, the, the airport is, is directly west of downtown, so there are you know, restrictions, regulations for all that. But um, as far as I know, nothing will ever be taller than that 1,049 feet in Miami. So eventually um, we'll have multiple thousand footers here, which is very exciting to think about. Um, but but it looks like that will be the the ceiling of Miami. So it'll be fun to see. And, and, and Austin is involved in making it happen. That's fantastic. So let me turn my attention to uh, Roberto Munoz. So I, uh, you have a an incredible sort of involvement in the community. Tell us tell us a little bit about yourself in your own words. You know, I will say that I came to Miami. I was born in Panama. Uh, interestingly enough, um, to American parents. And instead of being registered in the uh, Panamanian uh, registry, which I have a registration, I was actually, my birth certificate is issued by the US uh, consulate as an American born abroad. And um, I came to Miami in 1956. And so I've seen the changes here in Miami and, and uh, I had the pleasure of uh, growing up until I was nine years old in Miami Springs. And then my dad who worked for Pan American Airways um, we ended up in Hong Kong from nine to almost 16 years old. And because of that experience, I, I had left the, a childhood neighborhood uh, that was very suburban and very Miami-ish. Uh, there was Miami Springs, there was Coral Gables. 
Um, but Miami Springs was a very uh, American city and I was Hispanic by background. So interestingly enough, my mother nicknamed me Randy. I mean, you don't know that. I didn't know that. No, she nicknamed me Randy because Roberto at that time was not really a cool name in Miami Springs. So uh, I ended up with Randy as all my friends knowing me as Randy and I grew up in Miami Springs. And then when I came back from Hong Kong, I was uh, an international kid. I, although I went back to the same neighborhood, back to the same location, uh, my perspective of life had completely changed and was quite different than those around me. But that was my adventure into internationalism, which I have stayed focused on uh, all the way through, including FIU, Florida International uh, University, uh, where I have a degree in finance and international business. And I graduated FIU in 1980. And uh, my dad had died when I was 16. So that was a big, that was a big effect in my life. Uh, just not long after returning from Hong Kong, he died. Uh, but I did promise him I'd go to college. I paid my way through. I graduated on time. And uh, I had a lot of jobs. But the key with the struggle was persistence. The key with the struggle was focus. And the key of the struggle was a big promise. And that promise was to my dad. And so I learned from a young age that a promise is everything. A promise is who you are. And a promise is the experience of life that you need to carry yourself through because the promise is not only to someone else it's to yourself so after that i ended up in banking in uh, right after fiu here in miami i uh, ended up working for a bank in out of chicago uh, called continental of illinois i went to the training program in, in chicago uh, i worked there for three years the bank had a, a financial issue went to work for barclays so here i am in miami worked three years at barclays capital including miami and london left that bank to Fuji Bank, working in Miami and Tokyo, in Miami all the time, but experiencing Miami and Tokyo, uh, then moving over to Israel Discount Bank for seven years as a chief lending officer for Florida, uh, working for the Israelis in Miami. So working Israel and in Miami, uh, from Miami, and then, and then being a South Florida market president for a Spanish, very large Spanish bank uh, called BBVA, uh, where I worked in Miami and Madrid. And so 32 of my 40 years is all international, and it's all from Miami. So I grew up in Hong Kong from Miami. I experienced international banking from Miami, and Miami is truly an international city. There's no doubt that uh, this city is the city of today, but it is the city of the future. Austin Hollow and his family uh, are great contributors to this current uh, environment that we're in but also the city of the future. Uh, many of their buildings, as an example, not only house international people, uh, law firms, accounting firms, residents, but also companies that do business uh, throughout the world from Miami. And so we can say that Miami is international and we are, I'm very happy to be part of this uh, forward work in international reach. Well, this, and, and Roberto, thank, thank you for that. I think there a few things really come to mind here when I, when I hear you speak. It, one is that you provide, you know, uh, the pivot in and the approach, the look that Miami has is often toward the Caribbean and, and Latin America. And what you, you have that as well as a deep understanding of Asia. And we were speaking before, and I, I, for those of you who maybe interacted with Roberto, he um, used to be fluent and still, still, uh, you know, still can speak a little bit of Cantonese. And so, uh, you know, here's a guy born in Panama, uh, two parents of Latin descent, grew up in Miami Springs, spent some time in Hong Kong, really an international, uh, an international guy and a global kind of guy, uh, which I think is just uh, um, really fascinating. But there's something, you were just speaking well of Austin. And I think this and I, I really want our whole the whole audience to uh, to sort of engage with this for a second i'm going to ask everyone a question around this um for those of you who ever have a chance to meet roberto you will know a few things about him he is innately a positive guy and so maybe i can ask a follow-up question around whether or not how much he works at that or how that sort of approach you know, whether, whether it just comes out of him or whether he tries it. But the other thing about Roberto, I think that is striking, or one of the other things, is that he is the best cheerleader, if 
If Roberto is on your side, Roberto is the best cheerleader for you in elevating other people. And I, so my question to the, everyone watching and listening here today is, is um, you know that feeling that you have when someone is speaking well of you, when someone introduces you and talks you up, when someone just says positive, speaks sort of positive words about you to other people. Uh, I just, I, you know, after our call last, when we were preparing for this, I just had this vision of Roberto as like a cheerleader in the very best sense and, and got thinking about how people who have done that, when people do that, how that makes you feel. And I think there's something that's really critical when it comes to leadership. There's something that's incredibly valuable um, related to leadership that when you are able to speak well and lift other people up, you completely change what is possible for them to do and how they believe in themselves. And so my question to all of you is, have you had someone do that for you before? And so you might want to just drop something in the chat. Have you ever had people that, and it doesn't mean that you have someone always on your side, but you know, what is the effect when they, when they do that? I just, I, boy, do I ever love it. And so my, my follow-up question or, or challenge to everyone is, who can you do that for today? Who can you, who can you speak positively about or send a word of encouragement today to make them believe in themselves a little bit more, to lift their spirits? We all need that right now. And we, you know, these, if for all of us, I, I, you know, I think some of us are faring better than others, but boy, this is, these are tough days. And so my challenge to all of you is who can you speak positive words to and about today uh, to lift people up? It probably will also have a positive effect on you, but how do we spread this around? That's, and Roberto, so whether you know it or not, you, you put that challenge on, on my mind. So thank you. So I, um, my, uh, thank you. And I'm seeing some people uh, uh, mentioned here in the chat. I really, really appreciate, uh, appreciate that. So one person, can you do that with one person today? So um, one of the other questions that I had, and so thank you for those of you who submitted uh, questions ahead of time uh, when you registered and feel free to put questions in the chat. We'll try and get to some of them as we can. Uh, one of the questions was, was a little bit around, like, did you always, you know, I think for, for those of, for those of uh, folks who are on the call, who are on this uh, webcast, who may be at an earlier phase in their career, something that kind of comes up is, did you always kn know that you wanted to do what you're doing or how did you kind of end up there? We have this idea that we need to be, we need to do what we love, but for a lot of people, we don't really know exactly what that is, you know? So, so for some people it's easy, but for a lot of us, we struggle with that. What did that look like for you? Would you have ever known that you would have ended up in a role you're in, um, say 15 years ago? I mean, did this, did you always know you wanted to do this or how did it work out? Go ahead, Austin. So I see you're not on mute and then we'll, we'll go to Roberto. Sure. So, so yeah, um, I, I think that, you know, fr from a young age, I was fortunate to, you know, be exposed to, to the family business. Um, and I was fortunate enough to, to like the family business and, and want to be a part of it. I don't think it was ever, you know, expected of me necessarily to, to join, but I knew it was always an opportunity that was there for me. Um, and, and I did it's something I wanted to do. And I, and I seized that opportunity. Um, you know, even back in high school, I took, you know, business and finance classes and, and that sort of thing. Um, but I think it's important to figure that out for yourself. So I didn't just, you know, go to college and go right into the family business. I, I took the time to, to explore the opportunities that were available to me to make sure it's really what I want to do. I, I did various internships um, in college, one, you know, with one with a bank, one with a broker, obviously I was exposed to the family business as well on the development side. Um, and then after that, like I, like I mentioned, you know, I worked for another company for a couple of years and was a rotational analyst program. So I got to see, you know, a very full and wide spectrum of different aspects of real estate. So, you know, even if you think you know what you want to do, I think it's important to take the steps, you know, if, if you can have internships or other jobs in that field, if, if you can, 
you know, pick the brains of, of community and business leaders to, to get their perspective. I think as, as much information, as many perspectives you gather, you're going to be that much um, better off for that. Um, and I can tell you, look, with, with my family, the, the way it goes is I knew the opportunity was there, but it was going to be up to me to, to succeed or not. If I couldn't cut it, you know, I, I wouldn't be where I am right now. So, you know, you have to learn different perspectives and then you have to work hard. Just if you don't work hard, it's, it's not going to work out for you. That, that's how you're lucky by, by working hard. And, and I don't know your father, but knowing a little bit and having seen your grandfather speak and knowing a little bit about him, uh, it sure doesn't surprise me uh, that there would not be any type of entitlement mentality that runs, that runs in your family. And, and I think that's, uh, that's incredibly, but it's interesting too. And it was no sort of expectation. It was up to you. This was, this was your thing. So, so you, you had a somewhat clearer path than maybe some people, but it wasn't that it was defined for you. You had to own it, I guess. Right. Would that be correct? Uh, absolutely. And, and I think, you know, people think of people who aren't in real estate, think of real estate as just one thing. And that's not the case. You could be uh, a, a developer like I am. You could be a lender like, like Roberto is, you know, there, there are, are, are brokers. There, there are so many different jobs in this field and, and people don't really, and I'd say that's kind of akin to Miami as well. You know, people who aren't from Miami think of it as, as a whole, but there are so many neighborhoods and sub markets and sub sub markets. So, so it's all about, you know, learning the finer points of it to see what you like, what you're good at, what, what perspective suits you. I think that makes a, makes a big difference. Thank you. Yeah, Roberto, did you did you have any idea what this would look like when you started your career 20 years ago? 40 years ago. Sorry, yeah. 40 years ago, yes. But did you know even 20 years ago that it would look like it would take the twists and turns that it would? So go ahead. It didn't, And but one thing I will tell you is that I met Tibor Hollow when I was a young man. Uh, what was a difference is that I didn't have a dad when I was 16, but in meeting a Tibor Hollow when I was 24 and 25, and then the subsequent years of mentoring that he gave me personally um, was very enlightening, especially a gentleman uh, who was willing to give personal time and a man who's built, um, I, I have estimated 70 million square feet. You can imagine what that really means. Uh, that's, um, that's one, that's a thousand, that's 70,000, uh, 1,000 square foot apartments. Now a square foot apartment can, 1,000 square foot apartment can be three bedrooms, by the way. Um, but let's say it's a normal two bedroom, uh, and you're talking about two, per, two people per family. Uh, that's four people per unit. Uh, he's built space for 280,000 people. Uh, that's um, seven times four. Uh, so 280,000 people, that's a huge, that's a huge subsidy, by the way. And Miami Springs is not that big. Uh, so it's huge, a huge, a huge amount of space. The, the, the key question was, when I was growing up, I had an operating motto. Now, I don't know how I got it. Uh, I don't know how it was developed. By, by seven years old, I knew that there was something that I utilized personally. It was called skill and precision timing. I believe by that very simple rule all my life. It takes skill and precision timing. I can't tell you how I developed it. Yeah, fascinating. Back to it but I can say that I've had it all my life. And um, I've also admired people that, under, that kind of fall within skill and precision timing, because that's the definition of success in many cases. Uh, when as a banker, uh, I meet and I see many models, meet many kinds of people, um, very smart people, not necessarily overly educated in the word of college, but in the form of, um, of understanding where they are, knowing what they're looking for, knowing how to get there, knowing how to successfully execute, knowing how to successfully manage, knowing how to successfully lead, and in general, be a, a successful person. It's very interesting that some of this is innate. Now, I happen to be the incoming president of the Boy Scouts, which we didn't mention for South Florida. But I can tell you that that's a premier leadership program for young youth uh, in America. They have presidents, they have um, uh, astronauts, they have many generals on the field that are Boy Scouts when they were kids. 
uh, Eagles. Um, I happened to be a, a young Boy Scout. I also was a Boys Brigade in Hong Kong. But what's interesting about that is I go back to Austin for a minute because Austin is a multi-generational, is a multi-generational billion dollar company. Uh, normally the first generation like Tibor started with $700 in his pocket uh, and was scraping two nickels for a long time, uh, but was able to be very successful. Then came his children, uh, which in this case is the father and family of, of Austin that are older. And they normally are kind of like in the multi-generational family. And then comes the third generation. In many cases, I've seen it as a banker, third generation is not a value, is not valued uh, as well as the first generation or the second. But I can tell you in the case of Austin and, and uh, Florida East Coast Industries, uh, Florida East Coast Realty, that they are well secured in having a third generational leader uh, that will take this organization to its next levels of pinnacle or next pinnacle levels that are very, very important. Um, so I, I, it's interesting to see that they're the way that they train their individuals, their family members of hard work. Uh, Tibor will tell you that after, you, after a long day of hard work, comes another hard day of hard work, but before you go to bed, work more. So it is this sense of working long, hard, and being smart all the time uh, that has been the success of that company um, for, in Miami. And so they are Miami's blood, they are part of Miami's infrastructure, and they support many thousands of people, um, either in the contra contracting business, brokering business, leasing business, uh, and those that actually rent space to operate their own business. So it's very important. Anyway, leadership is key uh, to long-term success. Well, and I, actually, if I, if I could just jump in, you know, I, I, I certainly do, do want to add that, um, you know, and, and it really is the, the honest truth. If I, if I could pick anyone to be doing this with, you know, it absolutely would be Roberto, you know, just, to, just as my grandfather was a friend and mentor to him, he has served that role for, for me personally. I think one of the most important pieces of advice he's given me is, we talked about this earlier, the, uh, the double pocket square flower that Roberto is going on. That's, that's definitely one of his uh, favorite attributes. Um, but no, but, but personally, professionally, we, we've done so much with, with Roberto um, over, over the years um, at, at multiple banks um, and, it, and we took multiple boards together and I think it's, it's all just fantastic. And I think, you know, something that I do admire about Roberto in particular um, is he always wants to, to hear as many perspectives as possible, be as well-rounded as possible. You know, and on the boards that I serve with him, you know, it's important to him to include you know, younger people, people of my generation. He, he, he wants those perspectives. Not, not everyone sees things that way. And I think it's, it's a really laudable quality. Um, and then, you know, I know Roberto was talking about my, my grandfather earlier, and I think it's, it's an interesting quote worth mentioning, at least he, he and Roberto's heard it a hundred times, but he has a, a quote of his own and there's a plaque of it on his desk. And it says, work hard until you get there. When you get there, work harder. And, and he actually just turned 93 years old last week um, obviously, you know, current circumstances have changed things a little bit, but, but before what's the, the pandemic, you know, he was in the office literally every single day. So, you know, that's where I learned my work ethic from, from my grandfather, also from Roberto. And, you know, to have that in, in my life has been so valuable and, and I highly recommend, um, to, to anyone on this call, you know, especially, you know, young, young professionals, you know, find someone who can do that for you, who can be that mentor for you, who can you know, set you on, on the right path going in the right direction. I think that makes all the, all the difference. That's, that's, uh, that's fantastic. And for those of you who don't feel like you have that one person, um, call Roberta. It doesn't have to be one person. It can be 10 people, right? And you can, you can pick up little pieces and, and Austin may be willing to help you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's, it's, I, and I think it, it speaks to both, the, both of your, your approaches, which is a consistent, sort of need for the idea and it, it fits really well. And so I see this working really well with what we think about at the Center for Leadership. You know, one of our taglines is better leaders, better world. And, and we really believe that, you know, some of what we do are executive programs and they're, you know, they're, they're, they're customized, specialized. They've come with a fairly high price tag with them uh, because they cost a lot of money for us to, to, to 
do, and we want to bring the best. And we've seen that pay dividends. A lot of also what we do is to try and give away as much as we can. And that includes things that we that we put online. That includes um, lecture series. It includes you know we want we truly believe that we can be a service to this community in helping create better leaders. And I think what one of the things that so that comes out just th that makes this uh, your involvement with the center so great is that you both have this approach that we need to be continually developing leadership all around us. And so, Roberta, what does that look like for you? How do you approach that? The developing of leadership around you? I mean, because you just, you're doing it all the time. You know, Austin, before I go to that question, I appreciate that question. It's interesting, the quote. I don't know if you've heard a very important quote from T. Warhol. I just want to say, as I segue away from a little bit of that, but um, there are people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. There are people who know the price of everything and the value of nothing. It really goes to show that human beings, first of all, have to know themselves very well. They have to be trustworthy. Uh, they have to develop a long uh, career life of being the best that they possibly can be. Leaders are innately have one giant quality, and that is they know, them, they know themselves extremely well. Um, peeling back, we're all like onions that need to be peeled back. And you got to go as far back as you can, and you have to open up wounds. You have to get inside your mind so you can drive yourself to higher and higher levels all the time, and especially doing it without fear. It is fearful and fearsome to climb because you are doing it on your own and you are, and you are developing it on your own. And the higher you get on any ring or any ladder, the more lonely you actually become to the point where all you're hearing is the wind in your ears. Well, you have to have an innate sense that even the wind is speaking to you. And you got to follow that. You got to follow it. And when you look down on that ladder, you'll see thousands following you. It's interesting that you just have to know where you're going. Yeah. You got to find a safe port, but you got to know what port you're going to all the time. It's very important. That's a leader quality. Roberto, can you, would you mind sharing with us some of like, was there a something, a, a time you can share with us around? a hard lesson you had to learn or a moment when you sort of recognize something about yourself or something that led to you knowing yourself better or leading better or, or something along those lines. Can you share with us what, because, you know, I think the tendency is that we see people, we see, you know, we, we have on two amazing leaders who are doing fantastic things and sort of the, the sense is, okay, I hear what you're saying, but, you know, that's, you know, I, I, there's some disconnect between, um, between what some people might think, uh, and, and you, like, did you really have to learn those, some of those hard lessons? And can you share what one of those, one of those, one of those lessons maybe was, or sometime when you noticed something about yourself? Learning hard lessons, I think, is innate to all of us. As a matter of fact, in a day's long work, the only time you actually learn are the five minutes when there's a crisis. There is a five minute crisis and it's the way you react to the five minutes uh, that will change everything that you do. Uh, it's also important that those five minutes be highly analyzed because really during the day, there's a lot of just chit chat and not just normal activity. Mm -hmm. But it's in the moment of crisis that you really understand and become aware of your environment. I was, um, 10 years old, I traveled the world when I was young. My dad worked for Pan American, as I mentioned. So I went around the world 15 times before I was 13 or 14 years old. I was in Turkey and I was walking and man, I must've been 10 years old. My dad walked a lot. I kind of, we were walking a lot. And I told my dad, you know, my, my, my foot hurts dad. I, I, I can't continue. He said, son, let me explain something to you. You have three choices. There's only three choices. One, you can complain. 
two, you can sit down and I'm going to keep walking. You can sit down and get lost because I'm going to keep walking. Or three, you can understand that there are thousands of people right now that have a, that their foot hurts, but will continue walking without complaining and without mentioning anything related to uh, a complaint or pain. I told my dad, I said, no, I'm that guy. I'm not going to complain. Let's continue walking. Well, I walked and we walked and we walked. But the point with the statement was that you've got to be able to take on hard tasks without complaining. You got to be able to take on long events when sometimes you can't see the outcome immediately, but you know, you're on the right track. Yeah. And Boy, that's, those, those are great words for right now. I mean, you know, these, cause these are, these are dark days for a lot of people. You have to know that the, that the people around you also need guidance and they need to be motivated to go that long journey. So talking with the people around you is very important as well. Your teams require you as a leader to make sure that they know that you are or have the right way, uh, that you're moving in the right direction, listening to them as well, uh, incorporating thoughts and changes, uh, but without really losing your, your, your golden compass, which I think we all have one. Uh, it's those that kind of like are willing to sell their compass they usually end up in the wrong spot. Hmm. Huh. Yeah, and actually, if I, if I could piggyback on that, I, you know, I completely agree with, with everything Roberto just said. And I think, you know, a big part of success is, is knowing what you know and, and knowing what you don't and being honest with yourself about that. You know, there's really no room for, for ego in, in what I do in my business with what Roberto does in, in his business. I think, you know, if someone has an idea that's, that's different from mine, or I think it might be better than mine. I, you know, I, I want to hear it always. You know, if something comes up and someone's better positioned to handle it than I am, I'm all for it. I want to surround myself with with smart people so I can rely on them. You know, and it's about teamwork and, and working together and, and communication. And that's how you achieve greatness. You can't do it by yourself. You know, I, I've learned that lesson. I know Roberto's learned that lesson. You know, it's it's really important to to rely on others and, and trust them and, and look for the best idea, whether it's your idea or not. That's a, and, and I think, you know, you say that as you, you say that as if that's common among us all. And I think um, that you acknowledging that, I mean, I think that's a, that's rare, right? So kudos to you. And I think I was just speaking with a CEO of a company that has a couple thousand employees yesterday and he was telling me just sort of in general terms about a, a, another company he's advising um, that is, you know, multi-generational, very successful. And he said, you know, I, I see for a lot of leaders, and I think this goes for everyone, that um, so many decisions are not, are based falsely or, or inappropriately on pride. And I think that speaks to this idea. You got to know what you know. You got to know what you don't know. You have to sort of have an appropriate. And this also gets back to what Roberto said. You got to know who you are. And I think, you know, the way that I always like, and so I'd like to hear your reaction if you have any of this, that um, the, the, an appropriate definition of humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. Or another way to say it is it's appropriately knowing your strengths and weaknesses and being honest about them. So it's not thinking poorly of yourself. It's not demeaning yourself or thinking, but actually saying, look, I, I need to have an honest analysis. And that includes understanding what my weaknesses are. And I think if you know yourself and you sort of have that approach um, that, that uh, you know, that's where some, some, we can accelerate our, our leadership effectiveness and our development of others. Do you have any thoughts on that? Either. Austin. Yeah. Austin. Oh, um, you know, I, I, I agree with that completely. I, I think sometimes, you know, one of the, the hardest things is to be, be totally honest with yourself. 
Um, and, and if you can learn, knowing what you don't want is just as important as knowing what you do want. And I think if you can be honest with yourself about that, um, you know, what you're good at, what you're not good at, surround yourself with people who, who complement that. You don't want to surround yourself with people who are good at the same things that you're good at and necessarily want the same things that, that you want. You need to have a, a team that complements um, each other well. And I think that's a, that's a big part of it. Um, so that, that's, that's my perspective on that. You, you have to figure out how to be honest with yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you need other people to, or at least I've found, and, and we see one of the things we use at the center often is sometimes it's helpful in getting feedback from other people because we, uh, as much as we even want to be honest with ourselves, sometimes we, there's blind spots. There's blind spots that we have. Uh, yeah, so and absolutely. And I, and I think that, you know, it's, it's also not just enough to think about, you know, what do you want today or, or now or, or tomorrow? You have to think, you always have to be forward thinking. Um, you know, what do you want to happen in your personal life, your professional life, you know, a year or two or more, or more down the road? If you're not always thinking uh, in, in a forward way, then, then you're, you're going to get, you're going to get stuck. You're going to get caught. And, and I think that's an important lesson as well. Informational view from my perspective also includes knowing what you can't see. I've had many experiences where I've gotten information from the field that suggests certain things are going on. And then when I get to the field, I find that it's a not, it's not what it's, it's not what it's being stated to be. And many leaders forget that leaving your safe base of where you are requires that you leave no matter where it is. If it, if, it, if it leaves meeting, leaving to, it, to Asia, leaving to Europe, leaving to Latin America, to get a firsthand view of what's going on, you, you lose your perspective totally unless you have your, your own personal eyes on the ground and your ears on the ground. You also have to develop a very deep sense of the people around you, not the people necessarily at your level or at the top, but those at the lowest level, including the ladies and the men that clean your offices, uh, they have a perspective. It's interesting that uh, you would find that more people care about you at the lowest levels uh, than even at the highest levels, and yet they earn less. Uh, in many cases, they struggle more, but you develop a, a very innate sense. I once went to uh, Hong Kong uh, and visited Perry Ellis's offices, uh, George Feldenkrais, a dear friend. Yep, yep. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Miami, Miami-based company. Yeah, Perry Ellis, a Miami-based company, started it from scratch. Another seven hundred dollars uh, in the pocket and built a very successful company uh, globally. Um, I went out to to Asia um, and I, I saw his offices in Hong Kong and sing, in uh, sing, in Singapore. Uh, offices in Shanghai and Beijing. But there was a lady who told me one thing that was very important. She said, I have never met George Feldenkrais, but for me, he is our visionary leader. He, for me, is my father. I was looking at her as she was saying that to me and never, she's never met him. Say, I said to myself, what profound influence one man has, in this case, a man, man or woman, uh, a profound influence uh, from a far distance that people can have on each other uh, without you realizing it. And you have to be careful with your words. You have to be careful with the way that you manage. Uh, people uh, are led. Uh, paperwork is managed. And if you, if you don't miss, if you misunderstand that, you can ruin uh, your morale as opposed to building it, which is the key to the long-term success of an organization. And I found those words from a distance to be very important. So I've always taken trips. I've always seen uh, on the floor. I get my own view of what's going on. I listen carefully to, to those around me, but it's not unlike me to get into a car, a plane, a boat, and going seeing what I have to see to make sure that what is being said is correct. Mm. Mm. That's, that's great. Well, and I love this. Uh, 
this idea that we we need to be uh, having conversations all around us. And I, I, the, the story about um, George Feldenkrais also cues this idea that we often have a larger impact on people than we realize. Uh, you know that we may not even always understand the impact that we can that we have on other people. And I guess if we are mindful of that and we choose what kind of an impact we want to have on other people, there are huge opportunities for us to make a small dent, regardless of whether you're leading or not. What I mean is, regardless of whether you are formally in a leadership position or not, for many of you who are on this call, this is, you know, you're, you're not leading a team right now. Uh, and I want to encourage you that you, you know, that doesn't mean that leadership is not part of what you are doing in your, in your, uh, in your daily life. And there are not opportunities to lead, whether people call it leadership or not, whether it's formally appointed or not, is almost irrelevant. But many of these principles and ideas that we're talking about apply, and they can be amplified somewhat if you're in a position of authority or in a hierarchical position or a senior executive position, whatever, in, in an organization. But many of them really apply, and there's huge opportunities for all of us to take these concepts and principles and ideas and apply them across the spectrum. And so I hope there's some nuggets in here for, for everyone who's on this call. That's one of the things that I just, I love about these conversations and where the origin of this, this idea of the Leading Well webcast was, look, we've got such great people with such amazing insights in our orbit. How do we, how do we bring them together for conversations and, and just let everyone be, be part of this conversation? And so I really wanna thank both of you uh, for your generosity and your time. I want to thank you for being involved in this Center for Leadership on the Board of Advisors, but I also want to thank you for your commitment to building better leaders throughout the community and that, that you both have demonstrated a consistent and prolonged effort in recognizing that you can have a significant impact and really taking, uh, taking to heart this idea that, that, uh, that you, you are leaving a legacy and that you can build a legacy from wherever you're at. And I think both of you have pretty substantial uh, uh, legacies already and are continuing to go. So I, I want to thank both of you for, for that that you do. I want to thank you for your time today. And I want to thank all of the folks who have been, have joined us for this webcast today. We just, we, I, we are continually just amazed and thrilled that so many people want to engage with us. And I think we're up to 14 different countries now people have participated from. And so uh, we really believe that better leaders create a better world, world at the center. And so uh, Austin, Roberto, thank you again. Any final closing thoughts? Uh, no, I, I would just say that, you know, I think, you know, the things you were talking about, you know, are, are especially important here in Miami. And that's something that I think makes Miami really special is that, you know, here, versus some other places, some older, maybe more established cities, you really have the opportunity, whether you've been here your whole life um, or, or, or just a few months, if you want to get involved, if you want to build a community, if you want to meet people, you know, this city, this community is going to, to embrace you. Um, we, we want you to get involved. We, we want you to be a part of the community. We have, you know, incredible business community leaders like Roberto who, who want to encourage young professionals to, to get involved and, and to help build a better community for all of us. So I think Miami is a uniquely fantastic place for that. Well, um, thank you. Is, a, is a very simple statement of, um, I'm very blessed to have been on this panel today. Uh, Dr. Hillier, thank you for all your hard work and your written material uh, that you put out there on latest information on leadership. Uh, whether it's leadership through happiness or leadership through through hard work, uh, your your paper and the center's ability to write uh, op eds and activities is very very important. Uh, we have as a as a group. I'm, I'm an FIU grad, but I will say that having the number one ranked FIU leadership school in America uh, by uh, a couple of very uh, strong organizations, ranked number one, it's extremely difficult to be there. Um, you know, we beat Harvard, we beat Cornell, we beat Yale, we beat, we beat some very big schools, Stanford uh, or Sanford. We've, we've, we have worked very hard. And so I want to thank you for in your role, um, as well as your team, because your team uh, also represents the best that we are in getting us to where we are. So 
thank you for that. Uh, we look forward to your continued leadership at the School of Leadership, uh, as well as more papers and activities related to that. So I want to thank you for that opportunity. Austin, it was a pleasure always being with you. Uh, always, my friend. I know that the, that the, the company that you work at, uh, the leadership that you provide there is second to none. Uh, you are a, uh, a, a beacon of strength and hope uh, for that company, and I want to thank you for, uh, for our friendship. Great. Thank well, you thank so much you. for yours. Thank you again. Uh, thank you again to all of you who are joining us today. And I see uh, Bubakari, Gonzalo, Mutaz, Jose, Cheryl Ann, Marcia, uh, Shinaila, and just amazing. Great to see all these comments and questions. Thank you. If we didn't get to your comments and, uh, and questions, we, we, uh, Shannon and Amy have been trying to answer them as they can and, and uh, uh, some of those things that have been going on in the chat. But uh, we love your engagement, and we look forward to the next Leading Well, which is scheduled for August 26th, and we have uh, a uh, chaired professor from Dartmouth who is the author of a fantastic book, Super Bosses, Sid Finkelstein. He is a uh, friend of the center, and he has, uh, he has engaged with us many times before, and we're thrilled to have him next time. But Roberto and Austin, thank you again for your time. Thank you all for being here. We look forward to if there's any way we can help, shoot us an email, lead at fiu.edu, and uh, we're happy to engage. Also, lead.fiu.edu is our website, so we are easy to find, and uh, we look forward to continuing to interact with you. Thank you for being here. Bye-bye. Mentor many. Mentor many. See you all later. <laughs>